Thomas Goldcamp here with 24-7 Sports and Swamp247.com. Coming at you today with a quick 10-minute takeaway. We've got some big news to get to. First and foremost, former five-star tight end prospect Eric Gilbert, who was at LSU last year and had committed to Florida as a transfer out of the transfer portal, decided on Sunday afternoon that he is no longer going to be committed to the University of Florida. He's opening his commitment back up or his recruitment back up. And at this point, we don't really know exactly what's going on with Eric Gilbert, but he will not be attending Florida in the summer unless things change. Uh, From what we were able to gather kind of on the back end of things, there were some questions about whether or not he would be able to enroll at Florida. Initially, he committed beyond the spring semester after the spring semester had already started and drop ad period was over. So he wasn't able to get in in January. Well, it turns out there may have been some more issues even potentially getting him in for summer A. So Gilbert backed off of his commitment. Florida obviously loses a guy that could have absolutely been an impact player stepping in to replace Kyle Pitts, who's off to the NFL draft. But I will say I think Florida is probably better positioned to handle the loss of a guy like Gilbert than many other schools. If you look at what Maury Gamble has done, if you look at what Keon Zipper has done, the kind of production those two guys return is actually pretty good when you look at how it stacks up to the rest of the SEC. Now, I think that the frustration for Florida fans in losing a guy like Gilbert is he really is the kind of guy that can be like Kyle Pitts. He's the highest rated tight end in the history of the 24-7 sports recruiting rankings. He's got some of that same kind of electric explosive ability as Kyle Pitts can flex out at receiver, be a matchup problem. But for now, we don't know exactly where he's going to land. It's unclear, you know, if he may be able to get in at a place like Georgia, which was really one of the favorites before Florida kind of surprisingly pulled his pledge. Uh, But that's the big news from the weekend. So let's get into spring football. We did have a chance to talk to Dan Mullen today. We talked about a number of things. Obviously, Florida's only five practices into spring ball right now. So it's still hard to take a whole lot away. I think this next week is going to be really where you start to see more news out of Florida in terms of how guys are looking, who's standing out. The Gators will have their first scrimmage of the spring this weekend, and that'll be a chance for some younger guys to really start to turn some heads, I think. Because obviously, Florida's got a very young roster this spring. Something like more than half of the roster has never gone through a spring football. And we'll talk about specific position groups where that's more of an issue than others. Um, But one thing that I thought stood out from Dan Mullen's press conference on Monday was we talk a lot about building an offense around the strengths of Emory Jones, around the strengths of maybe a dual threat quarterback. One thing that Dan Mullen pointed out was it's not just about building around the strengths of the quarterback. You also have to build around the rest of the pieces of the offense. And he said he thinks people can kind of overlook that and get too locked into What's Florida's offense going to look like now that you have a running quarterback who can really threaten defenses with his legs, rather than realizing, hey, you you got to build around the pieces you have as well. And so when we talk about some of these weapons that Florida has, you know, Dan Mullen didn't really get into specifics on who's standing out or even specifics on what they really want the offense to look like. I think everybody expects it, obviously, to be based a lot around the quarterback run. With the stable of running backs that Florida has, you add a guy like a Demarcus Bowman, who has some immediate breakaway ability. I think that's going to be something Florida really focuses on. But in terms of building around some of these pieces, I think what we need to find out is just how deep Florida is, first and foremost, at these skill positions, because the Gators do lose a lot of talent. You lose a guy like Kadarius Toney, a Trayvon Grimes, a Kyle Pitts. Those guys are hard to replace. And so Florida's got to figure out, okay, does it have some guys that can be real standout players? And one thing I've one player that I've continued to hear really, really positive things about so far this spring from people that have been at practice and have kind of been able to watch behind closed doors, Jaquavian Frazier's. He's a guy that was a true freshman receiver last year. You know, probably the the lesser known from the fans of the two freshmen last year, Xavier Henderson obviously being the other, the brother of CJ Henderson. He had a lot of hype coming in. But Jaquavian Frazier's is a guy that really, really is well put together as a prospect. He's a big physical receiver. And I think this spring, people that are at practices are starting to see him really stand out as that physical threat. I think he's a guy that could potentially even push for a starting job. Now, again, that that kind of comes back to that question of who's going to be your really explosive guys? Can Jacob Copeland take the next step? Can he make that kind of leap that Kadarius Toney did where not only is he a guy that has a lot of physical athletic ability, but can he bring it on an every down basis? And I think if Jacob Copeland can do that, Maybe it's tough for Frazier's to get in the starting lineup, but he's a guy that's pushing, I think, definitely to be in that rotation. Another comment I thought was interesting from Mullen on a day where he didn't provide a lot of specifics about individual players, he was asked about Jamarcus Weston, who was one of three receiver signees from a couple years ago, along with Trent Whittemore, along with Deontay Marks. Obviously, Deontay Marks transferred. We're expecting 
Whittemore to have a bigger impact in the offense. But Dan Mullen really raved once again about Jamarcus Weston's physical ability. He's a guy that has a very lanky build, and so he's got good catch radius. But the one thing that Dan Mullen said that stuck out is he believes Weston is the fastest of Florida's receivers. And that's really saying something because Xavier Henderson is a guy with legitimate track speed. So whether or not that's translating, we haven't heard quite as much buzz on Weston as we have for a guy like Frazier's. Um, but I think those you, you continue as spring ball progresses to start to get a pulse on guys that are going to be more involved. I think, again, going back to how the offense is built, how many receivers Florida has that can really step up and be weapons is going to have a lot to do with just how run heavy Florida is, because you can certainly run the ball. But I think with Emory Jones's ability to be a dual threat guy, you, you need to have some guys on the outside that can really make some plays. You know, if, if Weston's stepping up and being one of those guys, if Frazier's is starting to become that, that's a really, really positive sign for the Florida offense. Now, one other thing I thought was interesting, Dan Mullen said they're going to have some stuff that they build this spring in terms of the offense that they throw away after spring ball. So really what they're doing is they're experimenting right now. They're trying a lot of different things. And the, the reason for that is twofold. One, you want to get a look at what you can do and different wrinkles you can add into the offense. But I think the second thing that allows you to do is that really allows you to evaluate just how much Emory Jones can handle, how much Anthony Richardson can handle. Because when you're throwing a lot of installation at these guys, how quickly they can pick it up, which parts of it maybe they're more comfortable with than others, those are things you learn in spring. And Dan Mullen pointed out, they didn't have that last spring. Now, they didn't have that as much of an issue on offense last year because you returned a guy like Kyle Trask. But I think we saw defensively, Florida tried to shift towards being a little bit more flexible on defense, having a guy like Mahmoud Diabate move to linebacker where you can really move them all over the defensive lineup and, and kind of disguise your pressure. Well, they didn't get to see it in spring and you saw how that looked. So this spring for Florida, as much as anything, specifically on offense, is about throwing a lot of stuff at these guys and seeing what they can handle. And again, I think once we get into the scrimmage, you'll have a much better idea of how those guys are processing things. Another interesting point from Mullen, Florida's going to play two quarterbacks next year. Early on, Dan Mullen made no bones about it. He wants that backup quarterback to be ready. I think any fan looking at Emory Jones from a physical standpoint, obviously he's a very slippery runner, but you have concerns about his long-term durability if he's running it 10, 15 times a game. Well, Dan Mullen is going to work around that by getting Anthony Richardson involved very early. And who knows? You know, if Emory Jones struggles, Anthony Richardson's got a lot of athletic upside. Maybe you find a guy that is a gamer, you know, so Dan Mullen, very clear that they're going to play two quarterbacks early on next season. That's part of the plan. A couple other things to touch on. Dan Mullen really felt like last year's offense was hampered in a lot of ways by the offensive line. And that started in fall camp when they lost Ethan White due to an injury. That really depleted the depth of the unit. And so Florida didn't really end up having some of those younger guys push for starting spots the way you would have hoped. Now you return John, Del John DeLance and Stuart Reese. We've talked about it a good bit on this channel. You'd like to see younger guys push those guys for starting spots. Because even if they don't win those starting spots, at least they're forcing DeLance and Reese to elevate their play to a higher level. But Dan Mullen does feel like they're starting to develop some depth on that offensive line. I think that speaks positively about what Josh Braun has added to the line. A guy that was a freshman last year and was very impressive. I also think it speaks to Michael Tarquin really kind of taking the next step. Those are two guys we've heard early in spring ball are really starting to step up really starting to make an impact on the O-line. So a couple other defensive notes before we wrap up this 10-minute takeaway here. Florida says it still plans to move Zach Carter around the formation defensively. Now, whether or not that is Dan Mullen talking about maybe doing it specifically on pass rush downs, you know, where Zach Carter can really maybe slide inside, pin his ears back. I I'm not so keen on the idea of moving Carter around. I felt like that kind of did Florida's defensive front a disservice last year. And again, part of that was by necessity with Kyrie Campbell out. But I think Zach Carter is going to be best if he's allowed to really focus on that strong side defensive end position and work on developing as a pass rusher because he's got a very powerful pass rush. Can he add some moves to that end and really kind of collapse the pocket to maybe allow guys like Brenton Cox to have a bigger, bigger impact in terms of the stats? The other thing I thought caught my, my ear a little bit listening to Dan Mullen was just how young they are in the secondary. And we kind of knew this. We've talked about it a lot about some of the young guys that need to step up. But Trey Dean is the only guy in the entire secondary this spring that has ever been through a spring ball. Literally, Trey Dean is the only guy. So you're talking about a, a unit that may be addition by subtraction, but I think fans are going to need to be ready for a little bit of a learning curve, especially early in the season as some of these younger guys get involved. We did talk to Todd Grantham last week, so we have a little bit more information for you now about kind of how the secondary is shaking out. Obviously, we all expect Kyrie Elam to start on one 
cornerback spot. We're not quite sure about the other, but we do have an idea now of who's playing nickelback. For now, that's Trevez Johnson, it's Kamar Wilcoxon, and it's true freshman Jordan Young. And we've heard a lot about Jordan Young impressing. I think he's a guy that Gator fans are going to want to circle. He's a very physical player. I know Blake talked about it on the last podcast. He's a guy that I think fans need to look out for. You know, everybody knows about Jason Marshall, the, the five-star prospect. Jordan Young's another one to watch. But those three are the guys that are repping at nickel right now. Again, Florida is going to hold its first scrimmage of the spring later this week. I think at that point, we'll be able to really tap sources and, and start to get some more information about how spring is developing for the Gators. But that'll do it for this episode of the 10-Minute Takeaway. If you guys like the video, be sure to hit like below so we can grow our audience, expand to more Gator fans, and be sure to stay subscribed to the channel. Thanks for tuning in.